Welcome back for more Bio 20. So this is week four, lecture two on simple cell movement. Our objectives and what we're going to go over. So last time I had the students reply to this and a lot of people said, I don't know what this is. Uh, or people were like, oh, this sounds experimental. This is probably bad. It turns out that we actually have been working on this for about two decades um, for mitochondrial replacement therapy. You inherit uh, mitochondrial DNA from your mom. So it doesn't like me when I do this because this part of the iPad is not happy. So this is from mom. So if you do have something go wrong, um, we know how it inherits. So the question is, can you do anything about it? Because there's no paternal side to like uncover or cover up bad uh, mitochondrial DNA. So we've been working on therapies for it, and one of those is a replacement therapy. So we talked about it. Um, I've had students from the last quiz who were asking questions about, like, where did, like, I don't know what to study. So I reiterated the point of the objectives, and then I pointed out how the test question, or the quiz questions came off of those objectives. So last time we talked about membranes and the phospholipid bilayer, and it has proteins that it can be integral, or they could be integral, meaning they go all the way through, or they could be on the sides, or what we would call peripheral, and they do all sorts of things. You also can have cell walls, which are not alive, and one of those tangential things that's not a cell wall, but it kind of is like a cell wall, is the extracellular matrix of us animals. So we are not necessarily immune to this phenomenon of having stuff outside of cells. And then we talked about the importance of membranes, because lots of things can go wrong with them. So today we're going to deal with physics. And it helps if we have a you know a little primer on physics. So if you were to take everything that exists, we can kind of put it into one of two categories. Either what we would call energy, so you could do stuff, or you could call it matter. So the actual stuff itself. That hypothetically you should be able to touch and pick up and throw or something along those lines. So energy is the ability to do stuff. And for our purposes, we're going to use that to mean you can move. There's a theory called the KMT. KMT stands for Kinetic Molecular Theory. So the K, the M, and the T. It's usually thought of with gases, but it actually can apply anywhere. Although, like I said, it's best applied to gases because it makes the most sense there. And basically what it says is this. If there is a temperature, stuff moves. The coldest temperature that we know of is zero Kelvin, so the K is Kelvin, and this is a zero, not an O, so it's not OK, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius. Some people usually end up asking, like, oh, is that as cold as, like, outer space? And the answer is no. Space is, like, three to five Kelvin, so this is colder than outer space. We have never made anything cold enough to be zero Kelvin, but we've gotten close. So, every, so that means that everything then has a temperature, and since everything has a temperature, everything is moving. The catch is when they move, it moves randomly. I can't actually predict how, how these molecules are going to move, whether it's in a, temp, in a table or in a cup of water or the air being, or the gas is being spit out of my mouth right now. I don't know how they're going to move. But if I look back enough, I can end up seeing patterns of motion, but I can't tell you exactly how each molecule is going to move. That, that's, that's not on the list of things that we're allowed to know. One of those patterns is called diffusion. So diffusion is a pattern we can witness. Diffusion is the movement from high to low energy. So diffusion, like I said, is a movement. So usually people don't talk in terms of high to low energy. We actually use the term concentration, meaning things move from high to low concentration. 
So this here is a pattern. I'm not telling you how it does it, because that is not really a straightforward pattern. But over time, what I can do is I can see that if I have a whole bunch of junk in one location and not in another, and I keep like take little snapshots over time, what I'll notice is this area that had a whole bunch will have a few missing, and then some will show up in another location. And this will continue until when you look at this, and this is the part that's kind of strange, is these two areas here are indistinguishable. I cannot tell them apart. And at that point, we would say diffusion is done, even though technically it's still going on. We just don't get the ability to see it. When we deal with concentration, there are units that we use, because concentration is the amount of stuff Per volume. So we can view this in terms of density, which is mass per volume, or it could be other things like counts per volume or something like that. So it doesn't need to be mass. So if you've taken a chemistry class, you've heard of some of these terms before, like molarity or percentages or parts per thousand or parts per million or parts per billion. Or we could do it like in terms of constant of density of you know grams per mil or something like that. So these are all just things that we can use. These are always going to go after the numbers. So if I were to say, you know, something the diffusion is from like ten to one, like we have two compartments from a ten to a one, this is meaningless because. I need units. So we can actually predict the movement of in diffusion because we just need to know where is it high, where is it low, and the answer is going to be it's going to move from where it's high to where it's low. That's always easy. So, for example, if you released uh, nitric oxide from the corner of a room, it's a brown gas, not particularly good for you to breathe in, what would happen? Well, it's going to fill the room until it looks the same everywhere. As simple as that. You have a beaker of water and you bubble in blue food coloring into the bottom. What will happen? The entire beaker is going to turn blue. It's going to spread out from being super dark blue where that bubble was to the entire beaker having the same shade of blue. You have a cell and there's a toxic substance that's being released near it. What will happen? The toxic substance is going to spread from its source, and it's eventually going to diffuse into that cell, if it can make it through the cell membrane. You're in Big Bear during the wintertime, and you turn on a space heater. What will happen? The heat is going to go from the space heater and eventually fill up the room, assuming it's not leaking out of the house or the cabin or wherever you are. But it will spread out. That's how heaters work. They follow diffusion. So this one here is an example of actually using energy, whereas this, these other ones talk in terms of concentration. But if we look at things like wind, wind is kind of diffusion. It's just we're using pressure instead. Diffusion gradients turn out to be independent of each other, meaning if I had a beaker and I were to put a food drop of one color, here. Well, it's eventually going to spread out. It's going to diffuse. If I were to put in a different color drop, it's going to spread out independent of what's going on with the green. The red diffusion has nothing to do with the green diffusion. And that means that they are independent of each other. So, it doesn't matter how many things I'm how many drops I'm putting inside of this beaker, each one is going to diffuse independent of whatever else is happening. It can't say, oh nope, too much stuff has gone on. Sorry, I don't get to diffuse. Everything diffuses from high to low. That difference of high to low, just for the sake of saying it, is called a gradient.
you've, you've taken calculus, you've learned a version of this um, difference between high and low. This is also actually coincidentally why cells are small. And it turns out this, you know, human average human cell is 20 microns in diameter, which is small. So the smallest cell we can see is a human egg, and that's a hundred microns. And the way it like turns out to look, like I, I'm not even gonna be able to replicate it anywhere close to it, but let's see you know, what I can try and do. Um, nope, too much. So there. So I think you can kind of make out where I put that little dot, right there. That would be like looking us looking at a human cell. So that space that you can kind of see there, kind of, sort of, maybe see, that's like looking at 100 microns. And I'm telling you that the average human cell is a fifth of that. It, it's ridiculously small. And like I said, that's probably bigger than 100 microns. So what we can do is any type of object, so sphere or a cube doesn't matter, although it, the math is easier if we talk about it in terms of cubes than spheres. What I can do is I can compare how much stuff is on the outside, the surface area, to the volume that it has. Then I can take the ratio of it. I usually write it as SA over V because that is easier for me to write, which is this one right down here, SA over V. So the pattern that we see is if I were to take a big cell and calculate its surface area and its volume, and then divide surface area divided by volume, I'll get some number. If I then take a smaller cell, calculate its surface area, calculate its volume, divide those, the ratio got bigger. So the cell got smaller. Um, smaller cell size. There was an increase in the surface area to volume ratio. And what this turns out to have to do with is diffusion. This is actually a diffusion phenomenon. In lab, so not next week, but the week after, and I believe the Tuesday lab isn't going to get to do this, so I'm going to try and do a demo in class. You're actually going to show the surface area to volume ratio. It's actually, it's, it's, a, it's super colorful, so it's actually a kind of a nice little demo to do. I'll, I'm going to, I'll, I'll talk to see if I can get something to show you all. Osmosis turns out to be an application of diffusion. It's like a special subset, meaning if I were to say, see all this stuff here, this is diffusion. This spot over here would be osmosis. So it's a, it's a version of diffusion. And osmosis turns out to be the diffusion of water. But the catch is, there must be a semi-permeable barrier or semi-permeable membrane involved that can separate the two category, two camps, or two locations. Diffusion, you don't need to have a barrier. Osmosis requires a barrier. The catch is we um, don't really talk in terms of water concentration. That, that's not something that chemistry people do. If we were in a hardcore physiology class, or we were in a hardcore plants botany type class, we would actually talk in terms of a version of um, water concentration, it's called water potential, but for our purposes we don't care. So the way that we can think about this, and that's what this figure is showing, is water flows from low solute concentration to high solute concentration. Well, what does that look like? Well, so if I look at this figure here, these little dots, those are solutes. So if I look here on the left, there are less solutes. And on the right, there are more solutes. Well, what does water do? Water is going to flow from 
less solutes to more solutes. I'm saying less because sometimes you can't actually quantify it in terms of specific numbers. So the water is going to flow from the left to the right. So when it does that, what are we going to see? An increase in volume on the right, a decrease in volume on the left. But if you look at this, these two areas look the same. Remember the end result of diffusion is everything looks the same? But if I look at the end, the right and the left, even though the volumes are different, but their compositions look the same, which means this is still a diffusion phenomenon. We use funky words when we just talk about osmosis because we are concerned about what is it going to do to a cell. So the words that we use are hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. Hyper is too much. Hypo is not enough. Iso means equal. Tonic references to a pull. So what do I mean by that? So if I look at a hypertonic solution, the solution, the stuff outside, is going to pull on water harder than the cell will pull on that water. So the water is going to be pulled out of the cell. And the result is the cell shrivels up, it crenates. Hypotonic solutions, so hypotonic, it's not pulling hard enough. What that means is the cell is going to pull water in more than the solution will. And the result is the cell is going to expand and then it could potentially lice. It might pop, or burst, or break. Isotonic, helps if I use the right thing, isotonic solutions mean that the solution is pulling just as hard as the cell is, so the result is it's a normal situation. For human cells, we talk in terms of salt, we are at 0.9% salt, or a fancy word for salt water is saline. So for us, our isotonic point is, nor is what we call normal saline or 0.9% saline. So if, we, if you were a patient and we gave you this as an IV, you would you'd be okay. This is this would not deal with any type of osmosis with you. If I gave you 0.8%, this would be bad. If I gave you 1%, this would be bad. But 0.9%, you're good. If I were to do this exact same thing with plant cells, it turns out because plant cells have that cell wall, we don't like actually see the cell shrivel up or explode we, because the cell wall kind of keeps everything in place. Um, in terms of hypertonic solutions, this one we actually give a weird term. It's called plasmolysis because it looks like it like popped, but in reality it actually shriveled up, so it's actually a misleading term. But osmosis turns out to be a really big deal because it actually helps allow water to go up trees. It tells us why salt water is lethal to drink. Um actually explains why we are very intolerant of osmotic change. Um, we control osmosis in our circulation because every once in a while our circulation can leak. And act like if you ever stub your toe or something like that and it starts to swell up, that's because your circulation was leaking. We had osmosis going on. Your liver secretes a protein called albumin, and albumin helps control um, osmosis in our bodies. Your kidneys help maintain the right amounts of salts so that, you know, we don't have runaway osmosis. And there's actually a condition called nephrotic syndrome, which happens to children, where it's, oops, your kidneys don't want to work, and the result is you swell up like a grape. It happened to my daughter. 
We even have a part of our brain in an area called the hypothalamus that contains these things that we call osmoreceptors. And these are cells that are super sensitive to changes in osmosis. And if they detect a change, they're going to tell your brain to say, hey, aren't you thirsty right now? I think you want to you probably want to drink some water. And they tell your circulation to change, and they tell your kidneys to change. It causes all sorts of ramifications. So when we look at these types of problems, they usually help if you can draw pictures. So like this first one, beaker with a semi-permeable membrane is only, is only to water, left side. It's hard to draw this. The left side here, so this is my semi-permeable membrane. Left side is 10 grams per milliliter. Right side is 5 milligrams or 5 grams per milliliter. How is the water going to go? So the pattern is you go from low concentration to high. So the result is water is going to flow from the right chamber to the left. Simple as that. You put a red blood cell into fresh water. So here's my red blood cell, my RBC. It's at 0.9 grams per deciliter. So that's the same thing as saying 0.9%. And then you stick it inside of fresh water. The fresh water is 0.01 grams per deciliter. So what's going to happen? The water outside has a lower salt than the or lower salt concentration than the salt inside of the cell. So the result is water is going to rush inside the cell. And eventually it's going to lice. That's, that's not good. It's why drinking fresh water is not, or pure water is not good for you. Uh, you take the exact same situation. Red blood cell. 0.9 grams per deciliter. And then we're sticking it inside of ocean water. Ocean water is 3.5 grams per deciliter. So what's going to happen in this case? Even though the volumes are different, it doesn't matter. I see we go from low to high, so we're going to have water go from the 0.9 to the 3.5. Water is going to rush out of the cell, and it's going to crenate, or it's going to shrivel up. When we solve these problems, the concentration matters not the volumes. So it doesn't matter that the beaker had more water in it than the red blood cell. It's concentration that matters. The volumes don't mean anything. So why do we care? Um, well, if you have a pleural edema, so you have fluid building up in your lungs, this is going to make diffusion harder. You're not going to have gas exchange, so that's kind of bad. You want to chew your food so that your stomach acid can kill whatever it is that you're eating because this is a surface area to volume problem. Baking or cooking, if you cook, try to cook or bake something that's way too big, you're probably going to overcook the outside and undercook the inside because it's a surface area to volume problem. There's a pattern between... Um, your body getting being able to flush out toxins and sleep. So allowing the time for diffusion to occur tends to be kind of important. Um, this one is not as well established, but there seems to be a pattern that we can find. Um, if you have something going wrong with your liver, uh, osmosis goes wrong, and you actually end up getting this fun little condition here that we call ascites, which is your abdomen fills up with fluid. And then we need to drain it off, but you have to then be careful because you can't drain it all off really fast because that actually changes. You can have massive changes in blood pressure, and this could be very bad for your kidneys. Like, it, It's not a good situation. Um, I've had the joy of gaining a little too much weight over the last few years, and the result is my hands have swollen up because of it because you're now putting more weight pressure on blood vessels, so osmosis gets disrupted. Uh, we already pointed out kidney damage. We know that there are parasites. There are certain things that we call flukes. 
which are a type of worm that can live inside of your body. And obviously don't drink seawater. We did a practice thing, although we're going to do this on Tuesday. Next week in lab, you get to look at cells, which is always fun. We're going to talk about forcing things to move next Tuesday. And then a question for you to read on your way out.